So if you're at all interested in handheld gaming, you've no doubt heard of Amber Nick's latest console, the RG35XX SP, which for obvious reasons I'll be referring to as the SP for the rest of the video. What you may not know is that although these consoles ship with pretty decent software, subscribe to catch the full SP review coming soon, there are actually a number of alternate operating systems to choose from. And to save you time, I've fought with most of them on my SP, and spoiler alert, the best one I found is MuOS. Side note, another big contender I got running on this guy was Garlic OS 2.0, so if you're curious to see a deep dive on that on the SP, let me know in the comments. But some of the big features that really drew me to MuOS as my top choice was the inclusion of dedicated emulators so that you can get more performance out of those consoles that kind of push the limits of the device, like the N64 and the PSP. Plus, the latest version of MuOS has support for Portmaster, which means that you can play full desktop versions of games on this guy, including the latest update to Stardew Valley 1.6, which I 100% got running on this guy. And the developers also took the time to put in web access to the file system so that you can manage files on both cards just from your web browser so that was a huge benefit for me as a tech nerd who doesn't like to move micro SD cards around too often and another fun feature is that MiOS has strong theme support which I had a little fun contributing to as you'll see later in the video. If you want to try out the other operating system options for the SP, by all means go for it. It's pretty low risk considering you're just flashing a micro SD card popping it in and seeing if it works or not or if it does what you want it to do. Uh, one caution is that you'll need to look for versions of OS's that support uh, the 2024 or the uh, H or Plus versions of the Anbernic RG35XX because the regular RG35XX is actually a full different chipset and I made the mistake of trying to grab software for that version and then just getting uh, absolutely no response when I tried to boot up the SP so keep an eye out for that and this console just became available so developers will likely make an SP specific version of their operating systems pretty soon uh, especially to support you know like sleeping when the hinge closes because right now mine just closes and doesn't really care if the hinge is open or not so we'll get SP specific versions soon but if you want to jump on the bandwagon ASAP like I did then the software is there, you just need to know what to look for. So first, how do we install MiOS? So since I wanted to maintain access to the stock OS, which I didn't hate at all, it's actually quite nice, I opted to use MiOS in TF Card 1 and have the stock OS card kind of as is with the ROMs it came with and all that in TF Slot 2, which works out great because MiOS is designed to run on Slot 1 and then have all your ROMs in Slot 2. And so it actually was a perfect dual boot setup because now if I want to hop back to stock, I can move Card 2 over to slot one. If I want to move back to MuOS, I put it in slot one, move stock over to card two, and I've just did a bit of tweaking to each uh, OS, so that way they're looking at the same set of ROMs and the same set of save files, which we'll cover shortly later in the video. And uh, yeah, dual booting on uh, this little guy is quite easy. So we'll head over to the download page for our flavor of MuOS and grab the correct image. Note that at the time of this video, you'll be grabbing the one meant for the Plus or 2024 edition, but I heard recently through the Discord grapevine that an SP specific version was in development. And so if you see that version available on this page, Go ahead and grab it because then you get more things like hinge support and awareness and all that good stuff. Once that's downloaded, we'll pop our non-stock SD card into our computer. Then we'll open up Etcher or your preferred SD card flashing tool and flash the image to the card. In my case, Etcher, every time I tried this, said it failed after trying to verify the image. But I'm pretty sure that's just because MuOS's flashing process asked the card to eject itself when it was done. So it couldn't actually verify the image properly. So there's a good chance that it was actually successful. So just go ahead and pop the card into your TF1 slot of the SP and boot it up. And you'll know right away if the flash was actually a success. You should see the MuOS boot screen pop up. And if you do, you're good to go. Just click through the setup prompts, hit B to save and then it'll run through its final install process before dropping you to the MiOS main menu. And like I mentioned before, MiOS is pre-configured to look to a ROMs folder in slot 2, and so even when I inserted my stock OS card after I already booted into MiOS, it detected the card right away, and so when I went to explore, I could see all the consoles and all the ROMs and boot into them with no problem. And that's pretty much all there is to installing MiOS, but it's the configuration gotchas and the hidden special features that really inspired me to make this video. So first, let's go to Applications and open RetroArch, and from there we're going to go to the settings shown here and to keep things consistent between the emulator cores for each system uh, especially because i believe stock has different default cores than muos does we're going to turn off these settings that say to store saves and states in core specific folders and turn on these settings that say store them in console specific folders that way you'll have an n64 folder of all your n64 saves a snes folder of all your snes saves etc and i chose to do this just to save myself any headache in case i want to switch around cores 
cores and not have to be copying and pasting uh, save files all the time because generally they all use the same save file anyway. Once that's done, we're going to head over to the directories area of the RetroArch settings and point our saves and states folder to the locations used by the stock OS card on card 2. And that's all we need to do for directory mapping. One thing to note is that because MiOS is using dedicated emulators by default for the more advanced consoles like 64 and uh, PSP, those are probably going to have their own set of settings for where they save their saves and states. And so if you want to adjust those uh, directories, you'll need to go into their specific settings. Like for Mupin64, at least I think that's how you pronounce it, has its own config files in the file system, which you can edit pretty easily using the web interface, which we're going to cover in a second. And for PPSSPP, you'll have access to the graphical settings as usual scene change. Next thing we're going to do is head over to config and then network and we're going to press x to scan for the SSID of the Wi-Fi we want to connect to and then punch in the password, hit connect. It takes maybe half a minute but once we're online then we can navigate over to web services and what we're going to do is turn on the SFTP slash web access and as soon as that is toggled we're then able to go to the IP address of your device on your web browser as long as you're on the same local network so in my case it was like 192.168.2 2.90 or something and then you just put colon 9090 and then it'll prompt you with a login screen which the password and username are both lowercase mu os and once you're in, you can access both the content of SD card one and SD card two. And the first thing I recommend doing once you're in there, at least in my case, is to fix the controller mappings for the Nintendo 64, because at least for the version of MIUI that I was using, the default mappings meant that I could never actually look left with the C buttons, which if you're trying to play Mario 64 is quite frustrating. And so what I chose to do was to map uh, L2 to C button left, R2 to C button right, and then X for C up, and A for C down, and finally setting the left bumper to Z, largely because if you've ever played an actual Nintendo 64 controller, you know that you almost never put your left hand over on that far end of the controller. It was always on the middle part, and so we actually need to map for Z, R, C buttons, A, B, and the joystick. Which sounded easy enough until I started to try and edit the config files to make those changes, and the changes just weren't taking effect, and I was banging my head against the wall, and I finally just reached out on the MUOS Discord to the community and was like, hey, what am I missing here? And the hot tip is that by default, uh, the Rice plugin for Mupin64 is in use. And so you need to edit the config file that is specific for Rice because that is the controller mapping file it's going to look to. So unless you've changed the 64 plugin you're using, you're going to want to edit the file named Mupin64 plus rice.cfg. Scroll down and you'll see this sort of input one section. And then if you want to make the changes that I made, you can pause the video right now and copy my changes verbatim. You can see I've added a few comments here to try and make this a little more readable as to what buttons are which. And once done, you can save the config file and those changes Changes will take effect immediately for the next time you boot a 64 game. FYI, I have tried nearly all of the 64 plugin options available on MiOS, and I strongly recommend Rice for the smoothest performance because other ones were just super choppy or the audio was glitchy. Whereas when I run games on Rice, I'm actually attempting to play through games that I haven't beaten before, like the notorious title Donkey Kong 64, and I'm actually cruising through it. It runs super buttery smooth on Rice on the SP, and so we're going to probably try and finish the game for the first time in my life. Okay. While we have the web UI open, we can also load up some themes for this guy and to get those you're going to head over to the MuOS discord which is linked from their website and then you'll see the section called themes and on that page you'll see a grid of all the themes that are available just made by the community they're all generally free which is wonderful and if they say beans at the front of it that means that they were made for the recent beans update which likely means that they have a few more uh, visual fanciness things going on and while on that page you'll actually see a couple of themes that yours truly created being DSOS which is a Nintendo DS inspired theme and Mu XP which is obviously inspired by Windows XP. Big shout out, by the way, to Vague Parade, who helped me with a lot of my very noob questions as I got into theme development for MiOS. The next thing we'll talk about is Portmaster. And so you can leave the web interface up on your computer. You can actually access the files on the SP while you're using it, which is super handy. And so you can hop onto your SP, which is now on the internet, head over to Apps and then Portmaster. It'll probably offer to install an update, which you can say yes to. And then you can browse through the various ports that are available. I just hopped over to, I think it's like Featured ports and you'll scroll down you can see ones that are quite common uh, some of which are obviously things like Quake and Wolfenstein but you'll also see some shockingly recent titles such as Stardew Valley which being that I'm a big fan of Stardew Valley and currently playing through the latest 1.6 update I had to give that a try and so what you'll do is you'll go ahead and hit install on that and then either on the ports page or in like a readme file that it leaves installed on the SD card you'll see some instructions for any supplementary files that need to be added for example if it's a paid game then you will need to supply some source files showing that you actually 
paid for the game. And so for Stardew Valley, in my case, I needed to go to my Steam account and set in the betas tab, set it to compatibility, which uh, made it download a Win32 version. And I would copy those files that it downloaded to, I believe it was the ports Stardew Valley game dir or game data folder. And once that was present on my SD card two, then the little .sh script that it places on SD card one was able to fire all that up. And it took maybe a good minute of like black screen load time. But then once it was up, Stardew Valley 1.6 was playing perfectly fine. Like the load times are a little slow because it's loading off of an SD card. But I mean, I was able to like do a full proper day in Stardew. I planted some parsnip, I was watering it, I was clearing my farm. So yeah, I might actually like copy my current Windows save file over to this thing just because the battery life is insane and it's just pretty cool to play it on this little form factor. And finally, just a few random like tips and tricks to round out this guide. Firstly, one thing that was hard for me to find was how to change the core for a platform. And actually all you have to do is when you're in the explore window and you're looking at a game inside a directory, just hit select on any one game in there and then you'll can choose from the list of cores available which will be newly associated to that whole folder so if you're hovering over mario 64 and you choose say uh, glide 64 core instead that will associate it to the whole n64 folder and now everything will use glide and all of its settings so that's how you change core associations i was trying to find it in the retroarch settings and couldn't so that's where it's hidden. Speaking of hidden keyboard shortcuts, I strongly recommend looking at the MIUOS homepage, which covers the most common shortcuts like holding down menu and the volume keys to change brightness, holding down menu and X to open the RetroArch menu when you're inside a RetroArch core, using L2 and R2 together to take a screenshot, and just cool shortcuts like that. By the same token, if you're going to use the dedicated emulators like Moopin64 or PPSSPP, there's a page on the MIUOS site for those as well that document their specific shortcuts as well. So on Moopin64, to create a save state, it's menu and Y, and to load a save state, it's menu and X, which is coming very handy for some uh, difficultly created platforming levels on 64 games. Also, if you're even mildly artistic and want to play with making a theme from UOS, it's actually quite easy. The process that I found was super easy is just to find a theme on the Discord themes page that is very similar to the one you want to create, especially with the uh, color and font and placement of the uh, menu UI. Download that and unzip it, and you'll see that most likely the theme that you want to create is just a collection of uh, carefully sized and named image files, most of them PNGs, and then you can just create your own that are of the same type, and then just place your files over top of the existing ones. And then once you're done, you would just zip up all the theme files, not the parent folder, but like all the like images, sounds, font folder, all that stuff, you would zip all that up and then just copy it over to your themes folder, which I believe is located on the SD1 card and then inside MUOS and then theme. You just put that zip in there. You can activate it from the uh, themes UI in config. And then that's it. You've got your own custom theme on your MUOS handheld. One word of caution though, be very careful about using any custom fonts. Uh, like if it's a font that someone else has provided that already works, that's great. But I tried to create my own font and converted a TFF to a bin file, which was malformed. And and uh, once that theme is loaded onto the operating system, uh, if it's a bad file like I was using to where it kind of crashes the operating system, uh, suddenly you've kind of bricked your SD card. And then I had to set up MIUOS afresh on my device, which is partly why I have so much fresh B-roll for this video. So to avoid that fate, if you do want to play with more custom theme creation or just play with settings that you're not totally sure about on MIUOS, I definitely recommend making a .bin image of your MIUOS SD card first using a software like Image USB by Passmark. Creating that bin will then let you do whatever you want. And should something go wrong, you can just reflash that bin file to your micro SD card and save you all the time that you had spent up to that point of configuring it. Basically making a save state for the SD card. Super handy, and you probably won't regret it, especially if you end up needing it. Editing Coulter here. After filming, I did finally figure out how to copy over the nice Anbernic stock bezels over to MIUOS so that you can get the original Game Boy Advance and Game Boy startup animations, as well as the nice SP look at the bottom and the sort of DMG border look for the original Game Boy. To do it, it's a multi-step process. First, you'll want to hop over to uh, the web interface, and you're going to copy these bezel files from SD2 over to the location MIUOS is already using on SD1, and then I went ahead and renamed them so that I would be able to reference them easier instead of the default naming, which is a matter of changing the file names and editing this line of the config file. While you're in here, you're also going to make sure you have your uh, GBA and GB BIOS files put in the MIUOS BIOS folder. I tried copying the ones from Anbernix SD2 card, however, they appeared to be empty, so I just downloaded some fresh ones from the internet. Then on the SP, when you're in your list of GBA games, you want to make sure you set it to MGBA, at least that's the 
the core I chose to use in this case. And then you're going to boot up a game and then jump right into the quick menu using menu and X. You're going to head over to on-screen display. And from there, you're going to head over and change your overlay preset to, in my case, I named it Ambernic-SP and set the overlay opacity to 1.0 and that'll get the bezel appearing however it won't have your video in the correct position so you're going to want to hit back until you go back to settings and then you're going to go to video then scaling and i found i had to turn integer scaling on temporarily to then set aspect ratio to custom and then really it's just a matter of matching the exact position width and height settings that ambernick had set on their pre-customized version of retroarch so for the gba it was x and y zero zero and then a width of 640 and a height of 426 set crop over scan to on and then you can turn integer scale back off when you made those changes and then finally to wrap it all up you're going to hit uh, back go back to the quick menu and then you're going to go to the core settings and save your core uh, presets and then you're going to go to your overrides and say save content folder overrides that will save both our video scaling settings as well as our bezel and so now when you boot up a game boy advance game you'll see the boot up animation in its original glory as well as the nice sp bezel at the bottom almost the exact same practice for the original Game Boy, the only difference being the screen position and size, which are going to be at position X80 and Y24, and then a width of 480 and a height of 432, and you'll save those presets as well. And then when you boot up an original Game Boy game, you're going to see the bezel, it'll be in the right position, and you're going to see the original Nintendo gliding down boot logo. But that's all for this video. Let me know if I forgot anything about MiUOS that you would have liked to have seen covered. I'm happy to do a follow-up. I am playing this device a lot lately and revisiting a lot of titles that I kind of forgot about or just never ended up finishing. Subscribe to help out the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.